It's good to see you all inspiring cyber defenders, cyber warriors to be. I see that there is still a room for us to improve as a whole community. Uh, first, I would like to thank Gregor for a great headline for my speech because we will talk about maybe how can we prevent this really bad scenario or maybe to reduce this 20, 107 days of, um, before we detect what is going on in our environment. So before we start, I'm Jiga Kumar. I come from Our Space Appliances. I've been doing IFOS uh, information technology practice for, let's say, 20 plus years. Started as a developer, then moved on to sysadmin role, and from there I roamed into the cybersecurity work world, uh, where I work as a SIM implementer, did more than 20 implementations all around Slovenia in various companies and organizations. Otherwise, I hold the title of a Splunk Core Certified Consultant, and I'm Certified Information Security Professional. So, uh, and in my free time, I do some weird shit in the canyons. So, you would say, what's the difference between your job and your hobby job, I always, you know, there are some similarities. I always work with risk, and I always have to reduce this risk to the minimum. So there is some similarities. But to be honest, I'm in the canyons not so many times as I was before, because cybersecurity field demands its own work, and you will see why. So I'm Kumar. I come from Kamnik. And I'm not trying to climb this hill. You know what this hill is, mountain is? Mount Everest, the tallest peak in Slovenia, not Slovenia, in the world. Um, why Everest and threat hunting, you would ask? Well, in normal organizations, when you do threat hunting, you have to get through the mountains of data. I would say big organization, you have whole Everest of data which you need to get through to find something which is not normal. So, do we have tools for that? Yes, we have. Do we have a knowledge for that? Not really. We have to learn this knowledge, earn it by our hard work. work. So this is where we call this field of work threat hunting. Um, what's the difference of threat hunting and detection? What do you think? Uh, okay. Um, threat hunting is more of a manual labor. You say, okay, these are the things which are important in our environment. These are the indicators of comprom compromise which attackers are using. Uh, so I will search for that manually. And then from these threat hunting queries, sometimes I create automated detections. Because for automated detections, I have to filter out everything which is known for false positive. When do we use threat hunting? When should we do threat hunting? You know the term Schrodinger's bridge? You know the Schrodinger's cat? It's a cat which can be in the box or it's not in the box. The same with Schrodinger's bridge. Either we are hacked or we are not hacked. We don't know. That's why we use threat hunting to see if Maybe we are hacked, that we figure out that we are hacked before the attacker, before we know it from the news or before the attacker announced on the dark web that they have all our personal identifiable information published there and who wants to buy it. Okay, how does every attack or detection of attack starts? Well, sometimes we say, hmm, this is weird, this should not be happening. Let's try to reduce the risk of getting this by using threat hunting. Um, well, how should I learn threat hunting? That's a question. And the answer is, one of the things how to do it is the easiest way is to learn on the real world examples. But learning on the real world example, it's a hard way, you know? Um, because there is a a lot of stress involved in this case because when you have a breach, nothing goes. We have incident response plan in our company and other companies, but I tell you, when you have an incident response plan, 
yeah, there's always something wrong with it. You always have to adapt to situation, and there is a lot of stress involved. And you know, if you have a bridge, if you want to do learn threat hunting when you have a bridge, it's way, 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 uh, way past the schedule to learn it because you have to have a lot of knowledge for that. And another thing is when you have a bridge and you rely on your logging system that they work, that they log everything, you have a problem because at that time you usually figure out that some things are not locked in your log aggregation um, software. Yeah. So um, maybe one way to learn threat hunting is by joining us next year. This year, for this year, you are uh, too late, but you can join us on Lock Shields exercise, where you'll be able to threat hunt to see what the attackers are doing in our environment, and then you can learn things. But I have a better proposal for you guys. There is another option. What would that be? Well. You can do your own isolated environment called Cyber Range. And in this environment, you simulate the regular organization, such as you have Windows domain, Windows servers, Windows workstations, Firewall, Microsoft 365 tenant, Linux, and so on and so on. So you are simulating real environment, and this real, from this real environment, you get the logs, OK? Um, how do you get the logs? Well, different ways, but first thing, maybe on this system install uh, EDR or XDR in detect only mode, so do not set it as a prevent mode, because in this case you will not be able to get all the details in your um, SIM solution. Do you know what SIM solution is? Is there anyone who doesn't know? All right, uh, so for you guys, or for everyone, SIM is a let's say log aggregator, where you get all the data from different sy systems in, and on these logs you can search, and you can do the detection automatically and alerts if something weird is going on. So all the logs from those systems need to go into the same solution. And you can have then to automate your work, to help you with your work. Um, Simulation tools, which are simulating the bad actors. So you don't need to have a red team knowledge, but it's really useful. You'll see later on why. Um, you can use Atomic Red Team or MITRE Caldera. Those are the frameworks which you can just point at them at your isolated environment. Never do this in production, please. Um, so you run this in your isolated environment, and you say, OK, I want to s simulate this and that technique, and this will simulate. And you will get your logs into your sim, and then you can do your own research on that. So which logs we have to collect from the systems, you would ask? First thing was on, of course, different systems, different logs. On Windows, we start with system application security, PowerShell, script block logging, and sysmon logs. Those are the logs which are used for uh, threat hunting and also for other detection later on so that, that will get out of your threat hunting queries. Linux depends. There are many different ways to log. One of my favorite one is either by um, having ODD um, fig, uh, config word like um, uh, Spaniola Junior already uh, told, and then you have audit bit, which is all another beast but it logs things on your, on, your, on your server, and then with sys, uh, via syslog or via agent, you can get this data into SIM solution. Firewall traffic, of course, you have to log this. Um, some people are saying you have to log all the traffic which goes through the different zones. I would say for threat hunting, um, first, to learn things, it's enough to have south-north traffic, which means traffic which goes into your environment, um, from the internet and vice versa. Uh, DNS queries, maybe for DNS exfiltration via DNS. macOS logs, if you have Mac, don't forget to log this guy. Uh, and of course, don't forget about cloud. We've heard about Microsoft's recent, I mean, not so recent, but attack, and it was via cloud, so you have to log this as well. And it's not just from where do you log, it's also what do you log. Um, 
For instance, here we have a configuration of logging in one Windows server. Really important, okay, here are the configuration and here we see, okay, log in, success and failure. Log off, success. Maybe it's log off, maybe you don't have to log it, actually if you have a problem with the data, how many data you are ingestion, ingesting. Depends on your preferences. If you have file server, you have to log the access to file server. Maybe this is a compliance regulation and so on. But let's go on. If you wanted to be a threat hunter, now we went through how can I, which tools do I need, which environment do I need to install to be a threat hunter, to learn threat hunting. But what will I do as a threat hunter is another thing. So what do I need to know? What's the knowledge? First thing first, I would, to be good threat hunter, I would have to be a red teamer. I would have to know how to hack systems so I could detect other hackers. Yeah, but it's, uh, you know, for me personally, I'm a blue teamer. I don't have a, really a lot of knowledge about red teaming. So then I go on Google, <laughs> use this knowledge which is there, and prepare my queries. Maybe as a shortcut for you, guys, for you guys here, here are some access, some applications, some binaries which you should monitor or you have to prepare the queries. One of them is PowerShell. It's used by many uh, actors. Then you have Rundle32.exe, which is used to load dynamic load libraries. It can be used to bypass um, app locker in Windows. Then we have PSExec, which is used to run remote commands. Uh, CertUtil, which is used for ciphering things, but also can be used to download things. Uh, RegExec, or to change Windows registry. Uh, CS scripts and W script to run scripts and uh, Visual Basic scripts on the system. Um, remote exe, uh, to, which is used to test things, but is also used um, by hackers multiple times. And NetSH to manipulate network settings and NetExe to manipulate uh, Windows accounts. There is many more, uh, uh, many more other applications to monitor. But, but if you just put in, you type in where your data is and you just put in PowerShell.exe, you will get a whole bunch of data. Uh, so you have to know what you are searching for, which are the IOCs you have to know. Well, uh, this is Windows environment. On, on Linux, of course, we get curl commands, cron tap editing for persistence, uh, open SSL, uh, find pl plus execute, and so on. Those are the commands which there should not be that many times modified or run. And if they are run, you should see what's going on, yeah? So, um, do you know MITRE ATT&CK fr framework? It's a framework which goes through the phases of attacks. And in phases of attacks, you have different uh, techniques which are used. So this is like a matrix which shows you how attacks are going on. And in this case, the things which are read, here are the techniques which were, um, which were covered by Atomic Red Team. So this is a simulation environment which has all these scripts which are run on the environment and that, that's the, how they emulate hackers. Okay, mm, so this is what is covered by Atomic Red Team and we will see how we can detect those scripts in the future. So here are, two, here are the things I will cover. Spear phishing attachment, malicious file, creating new Windows domain admin user, Password filter, DLL change, indicator removal on host, credential dumping, automated collection, remote access software, um, and exfiltration to text storage. We will just go briefly through detections which were detected as me who was working as a threat hunter in this case. So um, here we have a spear phishing attachment, which means we have some special user who received um, Email, in this email was a um, was Word document, and this Word document has something weird inside. And how will I attach spear phishing attachment in our environment that might be run? Yeah, well, 
It's just I have to know how the processes in the, on my workstation or on server are working. And here I see that, okay, uh, here we see the parent processor. We see parent process, we see Windows Word. And this Windows Word was starting CMD exe, uh, and it was running the uh, uh, Visual Basic script, and this script had, was art.jse. Uh, so this is really not a common thing in the environment to have Windows Word running or spinning up different things. Like here, another instance is uh, Windows Word is pinging outside. This is not a malicious activity, but should raise some brows. Why is it happening? Yeah. Uh, how did it happen? Yeah, well, in this Word file, there was a macro, in, uh, the user enabled macros, and this macro did some weird stuff. Okay. Uh, next use case user execution malicious file. So here, this case, this is a sysmon log. So sysmon is a component of components which can be installed on Windows, and every uh, process that was run is being monitored. Here we see that PowerShell was run, and this PowerShell <coughs> script um, was downloading, in this case, thing from the internet. Got thing, it was just putty. And then this putty was outputted into the temporary folder, and then it was started. Yeah? You can imagine that instead of this putty, here was be, would be some malicious payload. Not really a good thing to see. Yeah. So how do we detect this? Well, depends on the sim you are using. In this case, I'm using one, core, uh, one thing which is not free, but you can do with Vazoog or Elastic Security or things like that, which are free. Uh, in this case, I'm searching just Windows Lock and searching for string invoke web request and start process. And that's pretty much it. I got this result out. This is not a common thing, like I said, in the environment. Um, many times hackers to have persistent access to our environment create their own users. Um, how do they do it? Yeah, in this case, we are just searching for uh, netexe, which is used for manipulating users and user groups. And we are just searching for net user or net group. And here we see really nice um, entry where you have CMD exe, net user admin was created with this password. It was added to domain and then net group domain ad, uh, and then to the group uh, domain admins. So in this, this is really easy way to see something where is going on. You have detection for that or threat hunting query. Okay. Um, password filter DLL, that's a nasty thing. Um, Microsoft said it would be really good to have special way of filtering password. For instance, if you want to prevent that your password is set to Politi Advati Sochtiri Invisat, sorry, uh, summer 2024, uh, you can have a spe specific list of passwords which are forbidden. And this you would put into the uh, password filter DLL, you will, would say in registry, that this password filter DLL is this, this and that DLL. Uh, and each time the user would authenticate with the domain controller, um, it would go through this DLL to check if password is right. And when password is changed, it would say, okay, is this password okay with you or is, does not comply with the policy? You can imagine that this can be abused by hackers who might be dumping every password you are vali validating with domain controller. So if password filter DLL is changed on domain controller, that's a red light. This is really something fishy going on. So, okay. Mm. So over here we see that in the registry, this Okay, current local machine system, current control set, control LSA was changed by, uh, by Atomic Red Team password filter DLL. It was not a malicious activity, like I said, it was just Atomic Red Team running, but you can imagine this in the real world. If I would see this in my logs, I would need to go to the toilet. Okay. Mm. 
attackers usually try to hire, hide their tracks. So what did they do? Usually they delete system logs and things like that. And here we see this is Windows functionality in security or uh, in system log, it loads, uh, it, it logs that the deletion of Windows event log was created. Here we see that, uh, that it was really created. Uh, audit log was cleared, but we can also drill down. And here we see that it was deleted by running this command down here, bin event util CL system, so system lock was deleted in this case. Credential dumping, yeah, what do we search for in credential dumping when we want to, when attackers want to dump credentials, they always, or at least uh, many times, uh, work with uh, shadow volume, volume copy, and in this case you just search for hard disk volume shadow copy and maybe cert util or something like that, and you find that something fishy is going on as well, okay? Automated collection, maybe search for that. You just search if somebody is searching something in your environment uh, and maybe executing things when it's being searched or copying things on a specific location. Then remote access software, if you remember, Gregor before said uh, that reason for the bridge was Team Viewer. Yeah, well, um, over here we can prepare the list of uh, of the remote access softwares. And if we find out that on some systems remote access softwares are being run, this is another things which are not okay. Maybe we have company or organization policy which says, okay, you can only run, I don't know, a team viewer, and then, then you find out that there is some VNC viewer running on your systems. Well, that's fishy, yeah. Um, exfiltration, here we have some sample code which was detected. Again, we were searching for invoke web request methods, so, and post, this is the PowerShell scripts that were run. Uh, and basically here was just a static content, gen content generated by Atomic Red Team, so secrets, epic keys, and password, which was uploaded, uploaded to the um, base bin. All right, so some samples. Looks interesting. Did I convince you? Maybe you try threat hunting. Well, if you want to, there are some things in general I would monitor for as a user of a sim. Maybe it's not just threat hunting in this case, more is, maybe it's now more stepping into the detection mode, which is searching if there are some invoke web requests, uh, commands being run. So that means something will be downloaded or uploaded. If vget is being run, if curl is being run, so we are downloading something again. Um, if e, e, X, e, v, R is being run. Uh, if some power, base 46 encoded PowerShell commands are being run, this is also important uh, to know, but usually the attackers are using base 46 encoded, uh, 64 uh, encoded commands. But on the other hand, also Microsoft Defender for Endpoint is using this. So you will have a lot of po false positives and you will have to filter out the things which are generated by Microsoft Defender for Endpoint if you are using it. Um, another thing for me is a detection of running multiple these low beans which we had on, a, on the slides before if they are run on the same system in short period of time. Maybe filter out again some things which are there naturally occurring. But if you have this, this is a really good thing to see. Um, if you have multiple log bins running, this is usually a thing of uh, some malicious activities. There are some other real world examples I would say it's really good to monitor for. Again, detection methods. But Gregor said before, had a really good question of when the attackers win. They win when they put the payload in there. When they are deleting backup jobs and modifying backup jobs, they are already there. It will be hard to defend. But if you didn't defend, if you didn't 
find the attackers up to this time, at least here you find them, before they delete your backups or when backups are being deleted. They did not then, at the time when they delete the backups, they did not encrypt the system yet. They will do it right afterwards. And if backup jobs are being modified, also a really important sign. This is not a thing which happens in the, <clears throat> in the real world a lot of times. Backup jobs are being modified from time to time. Same with deleting backups. So you should really monitor for that. Anom anomaly detection, like PowerShell using. Our users, they should be, anyway, uh, restricted from running PowerShells. But sometimes it happens that they, that they don't have restriction. Um, well, our users start, did some user who never used PowerShell now is using PowerShell. This is weird, yeah? So detection of these anomalies. Egress traffic, like uh, SSH, RDP, DNS, SMB traffic, which is also usually not a normal thing from, to leave the uh, organization premises and other behavior deviations. So, yeah, different things to search for. There can be also advanced alerting. Yeah, well, you know, there is so many detections, so many things to see, um, and then you have, you are just flooded with events. We have event fatigue. Now we are changing this, maybe. Uh, so we adjust the risk of certain identity or assets of certain user or certain computer. Um, and by increasing this risk score, if the risk score um, passes certain threshold, then we get alert. This is one of the things how you could manage this alert fatigue. Okay, um, time for final remarks. So if you want to become threat hunter, you would have to have in-depth knowledge of how operation system works and also how your organization works if you want to threat hunt on your organization. You see, if you have your own law, uh, lab, in this lab you will see there is a small amount of data, but when you scale it to whole production environment, then you will have a lot of false positives, so you have to adjust to the real environment later on. Uh, I would say it's advised to have blue team, uh, red and blue team in your if you're in the organization, to have it in your organization. Because then you have a red teamer who knows how to attack this environment. You are not just running some pre-generated scripts, which are easy to see, but some attacker, some red teamer might do a different way of attacking you. So it's really good to have like uh, battles inside your organization from time to time if you have. Um, I would say to play around, to start with threat hunting, if you never, if you don't have a chance to do it in the real world, then you have to set up the attack range, so cyber range where you attack yourself. Um, and yeah, it's impossible to know everything and to predict everything. We are doomed for lifelong learning. Um, I would say that trial and error is a way to do it. And I'm really happy that you guys decided to come today because I see that you are eager and I think you will do lifelong learning if you want to defend companies, organizations, governments, I don't know who else. Um, so thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm here or later on. Uh, a bit provocative. Yeah, yeah uh, So you, you mentioned manual labor at, at this point. Mm -hmm. What do you see in the future? So will AI like get in the, in the way of like removing this manual labor? Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> easy, easy, easy answer. Yeah, for sure it will. But on the other hand, you know, trusting AI sometimes is not the best thing. Yeah. Maybe AI can be corrupt. Um, can be, can be in a, also in the hands of a bad guys. So, of course, there will be always some manual labor. We will always have to double check some things. But yeah, it should reduce our work, work to, to some degree. Yeah.
Um, if you train it yourself, I don't think you will be able to do it because day has 24 hours, you need at least six hours of sleep and things are always changing. So I would be happy to say I would, but that would be really naive. Yeah, so it's, it's better to have, I know some companies are, I mean, a lot of companies are already pre preparing their uh, specific data models on which AI is being run and will detect some things. I mean, there are also solutions which are having uh, AI already embedded and should be preventing things. Are they working? I don't know. I don't know. It's Schrodinger's bridge in the end always. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, anomaly detection helps, but the problem of anomaly detection is usually it creates even more po false positives than regular detection, which is, we call it rule-based detection. So, yeah, anomaly detection, let's say, augments the, the detections which are by rule-based, but anomaly detection does something which, with your help, with your head, you cannot detect or you don't have resources to do it, yeah? Like I said, one of the really basic anomaly detection is having user who's running PowerShell who never does run PowerShell. This is one of the really basic things. Or another thing is like profiling users. If the user is like, um, is doing certain way, he is like put into certain bubble. And some users are behaving the same way. And then this user starts to behave a little bit differently, jumps out of this bubble and you should get alert. So this is another thing. Or the whole bubble starts to exploding, then it's a, wow, something weird is going on. So like I said, the, the, the thing is anomaly detection usually just brings a whole lot new um, alerts which you have to deal with. No other questions, I presume. Thank you very much.